I motivate people to change by God's grace. Last week, we talked about how to live in God's love, to be motivated by God's love to change. And here I will apply it to how to help people to change by God's grace, how to help people to love God more, to pray more, to read the Bible more, to obey God and serve God. And uh, it's a demonstration of how to apply the teaching from last week. Because even though when people know that, we live by grace, it's God's love that motivates us. But many, very often when people teach, they start to use the law to motivate people. And when they use the law, it will be like this. Uh, you have to do this, you have to do that, and if you don't do it, uh, there will be consequences. Now, these are all true. But it's also true that God's grace is very great. God loves us very much. He wants to bless us. And, uh, that's, and also He remembers everything we do for Him. So these are stronger motivation. I use an illustration. If a wife says to, uh, says to you, I, I have to cook for my husband, I have to do this, I have to wash the clothes, I have to clean the house. If not, my husband will be angry with me. Now that is not a good motivation because the wife is under pressure. And it's true that many Christians are under pressure to obey God and serve God. And, but the wife can be doing this if she's loved by the husband. She's, she says, my husband is very precious to me. He loves me very much. He cares about me. And I'm very happy to clean the house for him so when he comes home, he feels very happy. I'm very happy to cook for him because he will like my food and I want him to enjoy the family. Now this way, she's motivated by grace and she will enjoy it. And she will enjoy taking care of her husband instead of having to do it under pressure. And uh, very often, many people just, you know, they, uh, they're under pressure to serve God and then after a while they get tired they, uh, they say, I'm not doing so well. And then they have other problems, like they compare. They say, well, someone else is doing better than I am, or I'm doing better than someone. Or they want to compete. They want to be better than other people. And they are afraid that God might not like what they do. Now, if people live like that, they are under pressure. But if we live in under grace, we say, everything I do for God, God is very happy. And the more I do, the more happy God is and I'm happy to make God happy but even when I am weak at this point maybe physically weak or some other hindrances I cannot do as much when I do a little God is very happy that way whatever he can do for God he's very happy so here the slide says so first uh, turn people's eyes to God's grace that People are not just looking at what they have to do. They look at God's grace, God's love for them, God's help for them. And the first motivation should come from God's grace. So the motivation should come from God's love, His care and His appreciation of us and His reward and His blessings. And God's law gives instruction and warning. Now we need the instruction what to do. And also we still need to have the warning so we know that when we don't obey God, there could be consequences. But we don't serve because we think of the punishment, the consequences. We should think of serving God because of God's love. And I have a teaching called God's Nature Bible Study Method and God's Nature Preaching Method. What that method is, to from every passage, I try to discover God's nature, His love, His care, His his uh, uh, wisdom, his motivation, his strength that he gives us. So all the good things about God, his nature, his wonderful nature. And if we try to find God's nature when we study the Bible, then we'll know more about God and we'll love God more and like God more. And when we preach, people will like God more. When people like God more, they will like to come close to God and they like to serve God. Okay, so the next slide. How to discover God's grace from any Bible passage. So we want to be able to discover God's grace 
from any Bible passage. God's nature Bible study and preaching method is like this, that in all the passages, we want to look for five things here that I list. First is God's nature when He can do what He promised to do in the passage. That for instance, His love, His patience, His kindness, His care for us, His acceptance for us, all this is our good God, uh, our God's nature. And then God's heart. He has a heart. Now, some people might be very nice, but He might not have a heart to help us. But God's heart is to help us to raise us up to a high level and God's grace is what he uh, the blessings he gives to us all the good things he gives to us and and then what action does he have to do for instance God's grace is salvation and God's action is he prophesied ahead of time about Jesus salvation and he prepared for Jesus to come and he prepared the uh, the virgin uh, Mary to give birth to Jesus and then to protect Jesus all the way and then give Jesus the Father gives Jesus the instruction what to do and then finally Jesus died for us and then after he died for us the Holy Spirit moves in our heart when we hear God's word to move us to believe in Jesus so these are God's action God has to do a lot of things in order to give us salvation and then what we should do to receive that grace so our response because God has given us that grace but it doesn't mean that everyone will be blessed by that so how can we receive God's grace what's the way to receive God's grace okay now here I would use a number of passages to talk about how to motivate people to love God so if we want to motivate our church members to love God so what should we do and at the same time, I'm demonstrating this God's nature Bible study method and preaching method that in each of this passage, I'm going to talk about God's nature, His grace, His action for us. So this first passage, 1 John 4, 19, we love because He first loved us. Now this passage, many people know it and it's very clear because God first loved us, therefore we love. So the motivation came from God's love for us. And so uh, this motivates us to love Him. So here, the first point, God is love. Everyone born of Him has experienced His love and inherit the nature of love. So because He loved us. So when we are born again by Jesus, that we also have the nature to love. So when we are born of Jesus, we experience His love. Now, this is not from this passage. This passage here doesn't say that. It's from the whole Bible. That is from the whole Bible that we know that <clears throat> that we can experience God's love and inherit the nature of love. It's from the whole Bible that we know that that we can experience His love and uh, that we inherit this nature to love to love Him. That naturally Christians want to love people. So, according to the new nature, Christians will naturally love God and love people. And the more we stay in God's love, the more we will love. So this is from John 15, that when we abide in Him and He'll abide in us, then we'll bear much fruit. And one of the fruit, yeah, it's love. So the more we stay in God's love, the more we'll, we'll uh, be able to love Him. So here, it, this passage talks about that he first loved us to motivate us to love him so when we motivate encourage someone to love god we'll say god loves you so much is there anyone in the whole world that loves you so much that he's willing to die for you and give you so many gifts and help you in your whole lifetime is there anyone like that and if god loves us so much are you willing to love him and when you love him he is very happy and he will for sure bless you and raise your life to a very high level. And then 1 Corinthians 2.19 But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. So here it says that if we love Him, He will prepare something for us that I has not seen. 
nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of people that how much, how many good things He will prepare for us. So first point is God is love. He treasures people who love Him. Now He treasures everyone. But when people love Him, we enter His plan. And these people are very important. Now the Bible does talk about when people respond to God, that God will make His plan come true in the person's life. Uh, in, in the Psalms, it says that for as, uh, as, high, as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His love for those who love Him, to fear Him. So when we fear Him, then we love Him too. Fear in the Bible means to honor Him, to respect Him, that we don't sin easily because we honor Him, we fear Him. So this is a godly fear. So when we love Him, His grace for us is higher than the heavens. So He treasures the people who love Him. And He will use His creativity to create things people cannot imagine and give, it to, give to those who love Him. So here in the Bible passage, it says that I have not seen. So we cannot, we have not seen those things that God prepared for us. It's so, so wonderful, beyond our imagination, His wonderful things that He gives to us. So all these things He will give to us out of His creativity. God, out of His creativity, He thinks of ways to bless us that we never thought of. And then, a number two point here, the greatest of this is love. So, uh, of, you know, faith, hope, love, all these three things, the greatest of this is love. So when we love God, that's something God really treasure. And then, this next Bible verse to motivate people to love God more. John 21, 15, So when they had eaten breakfast, that is when Jesus appeared to the disciples, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. So here, uh, Jesus asked Jesus, uh, Peter three times, Do you love me more than this? And then Peter said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus said, Feed my lambs. So Jesus uh, want to make sure that Peter really loved him before he assigned him the responsibility to feed God's lambs. So the first point I have here is God's kingdom is a kingdom of love. So that's his nature. His, his kingdom is a kingdom of love. God's message is a message of love. His message to us all the time is a message of love. And God wants to use people who love him to serve him. So he wants people to be filled with the love of God to preach about God. He doesn't want people to be angry, frustrated to preach the Word of God. He wants people to relax in Him and full of love and kindness like a loving father to care about the children of God and not to push people and force people. There are many preachers, they think that when they yell at the members, they will change them better. But actually, you know, the Bible is not like that. Jesus, when Jesus spoke to His disciples, uh, spoke to the believers, he did not yell at them. He only pointed out the sins of the Pharisees who don't repent. But when he talks to Christians, he always talks in a way to motivate them, to guide them, to appreciate them. So, uh, so first, we, before we serve God, we need to have this love, live in the, the love of God. So as a Christian, we want to glorify God. Do you want to glorify God? And the way to glorify God is we love Him. We love God more, and then we have more love. And then when we have more love for God first, then we have more love for people. We first build up the love for God. Because here Jesus said, Do you love me more than this? So first to love God before we love people. When we love God, then we are changed by God. And the second point here, God's love renews our lives and gives us a life of love and message of love. So His love can change our life. So our life is full of love, and then we have a message of love. So that's God's, uh, God's way that He wants us to live in love, change by His love, before we spread the message 
uh, of love and to care about his lambs. And then the next passage here, 1 John 5, 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. God. And everyone who loves the Father who loves his child as well. Now, I'm going to say I'm going to use a number of passages to help us to be able to motivate us, motivate people to love God. Because many preachers need to preach and train the members to love God more. So, there are many different passages that we can use. And from these different passages, you can see that in all these passages, we see that it's God's love that motivates us to love Him. That it's, uh, it's biblical to motivate people by God's love. So here it says that in this Bible passage, it says that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So when people believe that Jesus is the Christ is a Savior, then He has been born of God. Then He has a new spiritual life in God. And everyone who loves the Father loves His child as well. So if we love God the Father, we'll also love His child. That means He's uh, the Christians. So when we are born of God, now these two parts are connected. So we know that John was talking about the same thing, that the same group of people who believes in Jesus, they are born of God. And then these people who are born of God will also love the Father. And then when they love the Father, they should also love the children. So the first point here is, he who is born of God believes that Jesus is the Christ. The most important quality of people born of God is that they will love the Father and God's children. So the most important quality of people who uh, are born of God is love, to love God and love people. If we are born again by God, we have this new nature to love, but we also have a sinful nature. Now some Christians, they get angry easily. They can yell at people, they can hurt people because they let the sinful nature grow stronger than the new nature. But if we let the new nature grow stronger, then we have more and more love and more meek the life would be more gentle and meek to to bless other people so we want that this love of god to grow in us instead of the old nature we want this new nature full of love and then the second point here is god is love is love the relationship with him will bring love now this is from other bible passages that the relationship with god that when we abide in jesus he He'll, he'll abide in us, then we'll bear much fruit. Then, and then most important fruit is love for God and love for people. And then the Bible also gives us the commandment to love God. That is a commandment from God. So this is uh, the, uh, uh, the law of God. Now we motivate people first with the love of God, but the Bible also tells us what to do. So those are the, the law, the commandment. We need both the law and the grace of grace is the most important but when we we understand that the motivation comes from the grace of god and uh, uh what to do came from the commandment and the commandment also give us uh the the warning that if we don't obey this what are the consequences so here the commandment now it doesn't mean that we have the grace of god we don't need the commandment we need both the grace of God and the commandment, but we need to have the right balance. The grace of God is always higher, and the law of God tells us what to do. So here, this passage says that, uh, Mark 12, 29, Jesus answered him, the first of all, the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and with all your strength. So the greatest of all commandment is that the Lord your God is one. And we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength, all our mind and all our strength. So this is the greatest of all commandment. And uh, the first commandment is to love God. Now, I, I want to sidetrack a little bit because here it says that God is one. Now some people say, well, then only Father, the Father, God the Father is one. And then Jesus is not God. 
And I tell you that there are many Bible passages about God's uh, that God is triune, that Jesus is God, and then the Holy Spirit is God. And uh, a quick passage would be in uh, Revelation chapter four and chapter five. There it says, "All glory, honor, uh, power be given to the Father." And then it says that also given to the Lamb. So given to the Lamb and the Father. So in uh, Revelation chapter four and five, here it put God the Father and Jesus in the same level. That all praise and glory and strength and power be given to the Father. The, uh, the one on the throne and also to the Lamb of God who is Jesus Christ who has been slain for us and also Isaiah 9 6 that uh, that he is uh, that a child is born for us and his name is um, Almighty God now the Jehovah Witnesses would say that this is Mighty God and some people answer them like this uh, uh, the person says you are uh, you believe in many gods. They say no. Because Jehovah Witnesses that Jesus said Jesus is a God. And then the Father is the God. So the person says, then you believe in God the Father and also Jesus is another God. So they could not answer. That you know the Bible talks about says that there is only one God. There is no other God than Almighty God. So when the Bible says that He is God, you know, and also everlasting Father, He is mighty God and everlasting Father, that means He is, Jesus is God. So God is one. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. Okay, now so here the first commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, from the whole heart, and then with all our soul. Our soul includes our spirit and our soul, the whole being, and our mind, our thinking, and our strength, with all our strength. And the first, so the first commandment is to love God. And also, God loves us first and blesses us, so we should also love Him. So this would motivate people to love God. Okay, and then warning to people who don't love God. So this is the law. Both instruction and warning are of the law. 1 Corinthians 16.22 If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. So here, that anyone who does not love the Lord our God, let him be... If anyone doesn't love Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. So anyone who doesn't love Jesus, be accursed. Now. The first point here is God is love. Born again Christians will love. Then we have the new nature of God. We will love. And if a person does not love, there is problem with his spiritual life. There is problem with this, you know, that he, because if he is born again, then he would have love. But he, if he is not born again, and has no love, he will be cursed. So, if a person is born again, naturally he have love. If he doesn't have love there must be something wrong. Maybe he's not born again. So we want to make sure that we are born again by repenting of our sins and trusting in Jesus as our Savior and ask God to forgive us and repent every day and ask Him to forgive us. Then God will renew our life and we read the Bible to nourish us so that we will follow God's way. And then point number two is because of our sinful nature, Christians sometimes lack love. If a Christian continues to have low lo no love, he can lose salvation. So we do have a sinful nature. We all have a sinful nature. And the sinful nature will sometimes uh, be angry with people, want to hurt people, want to do negative things and say negative things and be frustrated. And if a person let his sinful nature control him, that is filled with anger, or he commit, commit adultery, there are many warnings in the Bible that the person can lose salvation, that he who reap to the flesh will reap destruction, that if we continue not to follow God, then he can, he can lose his salvation. And in, uh, in uh, Timothy epistle, it says that in the last day, the Holy Spirit says that many will depart from the truth. And Jesus said in the last days, many one will fall away 
and they will stumble and they will hurt each, uh, hurt each other. So warning to people who don't love God. If they don't love God, they are cursed by God. Any real Christian should have love for God. But some Christians have very little love. What they want is just blessings from God. So that's something we want to correct in our life, that we don't just want to get blessings. We want to respond to God with love. That way we are connected to God. God connects with us and we are connected to Him. And then our life will be changed by God. Okay, and then the next uh, point here is to motivate people to pray. Now we want to motivate people to pray by grace. Now some people motivate pe other people to pray like this. You have to pray. If you don't pray, you won't get the blessings. You, you must pray to God. It's all saying you must, you have to. Now it's true. We must pray. But there are many reasons why we pray. We don't just pray because we must pray. It's like um, when someone uh, loves his husband, I mean love his uh, wife or her husband, it should not be just the motivation of uh, I have to do it, but the motivation that I want to build up this love relationship. I want to enjoy this love relationship. So these are passages to motivate people to love, to pray. Matthew 6, 8, Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So before we ask the Father, He already knows the things we have need for. So God already knows our need. The first point is God knows our needs. He is Almighty. He, he cares about us. He knows our heart. He knows our needs. So His nature and His ability. And then number two, God cares about the sparrows that in other passages it says that you know, God will take care of the sparrows, but we are more precious than many sparrows. So He will care about me much more than He cares about the sparrows. And then we don't have to keep telling God about our needs. We don't have, when we pray, we don't have to keep saying, Oh God, I need more money. I need a wife. I need everything. I need many things. Please help me. Please help me. We don't need to keep telling God. When we love God, He knows our needs and then He will bless us. And then number four, when we love and obey God, He will give the best to us. So there are a number of passages that tell us that. When we seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to us. So when we love Him and obey Him, He will give us the best so we don't have to. When we pray, we don't have to worry and say, Oh God, when will you give me the blessings? When will you do this to me? When will you answer my prayer? We don't have to do that. People do that because they lack faith in God. They don't think that God will bless them. I hope we all will believe that God is a loving God and He's a God of blessings. When we follow Him, even though we are not perfect, when we love Him, we follow Him, He's very happy and He will for sure bless us. And then this another passage to motivate us to pray, Zephaniah 3.17, that God will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with His love he will rejoice over you with singing. So here it talks about God's joyful nature. He's a joyful God. And He's a God of appreciation. A God, a heart to treasure people. He has a heart to treasure people. That is His wonderful nature. He doesn't despise people. Although people sin a lot and people uh, don't obey Him. And still He is happy with people. And especially when people love God. He's very, very happy with them. So God is a happy God. So very important to build up the relationship. Okay, the first point, God loves us and enjoy the relationship with us. He enjoyed the relationship. Here it says that He rejoiced over you with singing. So He enjoyed that relationship with us. For God is not just a duty to save us and help us. For God is something He enjoys to bless us. So in our prayer, in our prayer, it's more important to trust in His love and to love Him, to build up this relationship because He, he loves us already. We don't have to uh, remind Him to love us. We don't have to remind Him to bless us. He already knows our needs. So it's more important to trust in His love and say, God, you're loving me. You're blessing me. You, you have many wonderful things to prepare for me. You have a wonderful plan for me. So we trust in His love and if we love Him, 
then we can live in His perfect love. Then we don't worry. And we know that He is happy whenever we pray. That will motivate us to pray. That whenever we pray, He is very happy and will, He will for sure bless us. And then number three, when we build up our relationship with God, He will give us the best. So when we you know, really make God happy and we really enjoy Him and love Him and respond to Him, He will give us the best. We seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be given to us. So all these Bible verses tell us how God is happy with us and then when we serve God, He's very happy. When we love Him, He's very happy and for sure He'll answer our prayers. And then another passage to motivate us to pray is Matthew 6.33. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Now first, God's kingdom, what does that mean? First, it means the kingdom of grace, that people are saved in the kingdom of grace, that people have salvation. So the first point to seek God's kingdom is to help more people to be born again, to be safe and to follow God. So that's seeking God's kingdom. Now I know some people, they, they emphasize on the millennium, the millennial kingdom on earth. And they say when Jesus talked about God's kingdom, He is talking about the millennial kingdom. Now I searched through the whole Bible. Actually my thesis in my master degree of theology in the seminary was on Kingdom of God and also on the uh, dispensationalist view of the Kingdom of God, whether it's biblical or not. And I looked through all the Bible passages in the whole Bible and especially in the Gospels. So when Jesus talked about the Kingdom, what does He talk about? Uh, in Matthew 13, and 20 and 25, those are the parables of the kingdom of God. In Matthew 13, he said that, you know, there is a sower who sows a seed, and the seed falls on four different kinds of ground. And then the first, uh, you probably know that the first one is the, the rocky road, and the second one is the shallow soil, and the third one is the, uh, the ground with thistle and thorns, and the fourth kind is the good soil, and then the the seed will bear fruit 100 times, 60 times, 30 times. So here talk about how the Word of God take root in people's heart and then people are saved and they are born again and they are changed. And then also the, the parable of the tares that God sows the weeds and then the enemy came and sowed the tares and then so both grow together and then the uh, the servant asked, should we go and t pull out the tares? But then the master said, no, because if you pull out the tares, you might pull out the wheat also. And then on the last day, the angels will come and separate the wheat from the tares, and the wheat will be put into the kingdom of God, and then the tares will be bo burned. So here, it talks about that uh, the parable here is about people who are saved, and also about people who are born of the devil. To follow the ways of the devil and then those who are born of the Word of God will have eternal life when Jesus comes back and then those who are born of the devil will, will uh, die and then go to hell and be burned and, uh, and then in uh, Matthew 20 it talks about that in the kingdom of God the people will be everyone will be rewarded uh, uh, that uh, the master will give him the money that God has promised to give the, uh, the master promised to give to the workers so we so it's about the the blessing the eternal life that we receive uh, and here in the parable is everyone gets the same so this is about eternal life not about reward of our good works and then in Matthew 25 the three parables are talking about when Jesus comes back the first one is about the ten virgins so when the bridegroom comes back, the bridegroom will, you know, receive the five wise, uh, uh, the virgins, who are wise and prepare and have oil, and then the foolish virgins they don't have the oil and then they are shut out of the door. 
So here it talks about preparing for Jesus' second coming to have this oil could be salvation or the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then the second parable is about the five uh, the servant with given five talents, two talents, and one talent, and the five servant with the five talents and the two talents earn more, and then they are rewarded. And then the one with the one talent, he didn't he buried the talent, and then he was cast out into the outer darkness. And then the third parable is when Jesus comes back with power and authority, and all people will be in front of him, separate into the sheep and the goats. And the sheep are the ones who have done good things to Jesus, to uh, Jesus' brothers. And then they will have eternal life. And then those who uh, don't do the good things to, the, to Jesus' brothers, then they will be thrown into the fire, prepared for the devil and his servants and his angels. So here it talks about also whether we are loving to the people. When we are loving to uh, Jesus' brothers. Now some people say this Jesus' brothers are Jews only. Now where in the Bible would tell us that it's only the Jews? Uh, didn't the Bible say also that we inherit that Paul said that we are the same, we receive the same inheritance as the Jews. So where does the Bible say that it's only for the, for the Jews here? So here it talks about in Matthew 25 is whether the, the sheep has done good to, the, uh, to, the, to Jesus' brothers and then whether they have not done it. So our good works will determine whether we have eternal life. Now we're not saved by good works, but our faith will always bear fruit. We are saved by grace through faith. But when we have this saving faith, we always bear fruit. So this parable is also about people whether they bear fruit, they, they love God's people, and then they bless them. So in all these uh, words about the kingdom of God is always about salvation, whether we follow God or not, whether we obey Him and bear fruit, nothing about uh, the millennial kingdom. Jesus never talked about the millennial kingdom. So uh, in... So when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, when we look at all the words of Jesus about the kingdom, it's all about the kingdom of grace and His kingdom of glory when He comes back, never about the millennial kingdom. So uh, seek first the kingdom means we want more people saved. We want to bring people into salvation, to be born again. And then the second meaning to seek the kingdom of God is to let Him rule over us, that He is our Lord. Because wherever God rules over us, there is His kingdom. The kingdom is when the king is the king. When the king is not the king, that's not His kingdom. So when Jesus is the king in the heart, then he, His kingdom is in the heart. So when we seek God's kingdom, means we let God be our Lord. So then when we seek His righteousness, means to obey Him, obey the commandment. So when we seek His kingdom and His righteousness, and He will give us all these things. We need to enter His will. Now, it doesn't mean we will become rich. He can make us rich. But the most important thing, we can enter God's will, which is the best for us. God's will is that we all live an abundant life, that we can bless people. Our life is blessed by God, and we can bless people, and we enjoy His love and peace and joy, and we bear fruit for Him. So that's His will. And His will is that we enjoy life here, even though we could have persecution. But in the persecution, we also have joy and strength. So when we seek His kingdom, He'll give us His kingdom and His righteousness. He'll give us all the things necessary for us to live out this abundant life. And many people have problems because they don't seek God's kingdom and righteousness. Now, some people say, how come I believe in Jesus and my marriage is broken up? Uh, I don't have good friends. I cannot keep my job and all kinds of problems. Now, many of these problems are caused by people's sin. When they yell at the husband and wife, when they uh, get angry easily, they don't love people, they don't fulfill their responsibilities, then they have problems. So many people, they have problems not because God doesn't care about them, it's because they sin. And when they sin, there is a barrier between God and them. Now, if, 
Now, even though some Christians they are saved and they have sinned, they are not separated from God if they repent. But the sin will have a price, and the price will cause the blessings of God not to be able to come to them so easily. So, because they fight easily and they get angry and they don't have friends, and then what happens is their life is full of bitterness and frustration and all kinds of problems. Okay, and then the next verse, First Corinthians two nine. I has not seen. Now we saw that earlier, but now here we use it to motivate people to pray. Nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. So when we love Him, God has prepared all these wonderful things for us. So when we sincerely love God, we'll, He will prepare for us things we cannot imagine. So in our prayers, it's more important to love God than to ask for blessings. So this passage can be used earlier to motivate us to love God. But also here to motivate us to pray. So in our prayer, it's more important to love God than just to ask, "Oh, I need more money. I not. I need a wife. I need a job. I need uh, more friends." It's not just asking for what we need, but in a prayer, it's more important to love Him because when we love Him, He'll prepare for us things that we never imagined. So that's the wonderful thing about God. He will. He will know our needs. He, and He will prepare for us what we need. And then, so this gives us motivation to spend more time loving Him in our prayers. So in our prayers, spend more time loving God. Lord, Lord, You're so wonderful. I love You. I adore You. I need You. I worship You. Hallelujah. And then the, the prayer of uh, the interactive prayer. Whenever I pray to You, You always respond because that's what the Bible says, that You always respond and bless me and You remember and uh, my prayer and you bless me hallelujah i can rejoice in you and be strengthened by you so we have confidence that whenever we love god he will always bless our whole life okay and then another verse motivate us to pray john six forty four. no one can come to me let's talk about jesus unless the father who sent me draws him so here it talks about that is god who draws us to him first Dra god draws us to Jesus, draw us to believe in Jesus. So first point, it is God who takes this, the initiative to attract us to Him, so we don't have to worry that God does not accept us. So it's Him who is seeking us. So we don't have to worry and say, God, where are you? Why are you not helping me? God is helping us. It's the problem is our faith that blocks God. But if we have faith in Him, we have uh, we trust that He is good. His blessings will come for sure. And whenever we pray, we have peace and joy. That's already the answer of God. And He will bless us more. So the first thing when we pray is that we, you know, that we know that God is it's God who takes the initiative to attract us so we don't have to worry that God is not hear, uh, hearing our prayer. Number two, even when we sin and are lazy to pray, He still tries to attract us back to Him. Even when we sin, He still attracts us. So that's wonderful. Now, it doesn't mean that then we want to sin more. We don't want to sin because sin can separate us from God and also sin will bring destruction. But even when we sin, God still doesn't give us up. He still continues to attract us. And then the third point, so we can be confident that it's not hard to come close to God. And it's not hard for God to bless us because it's Him who attracts us first. So we don't have to worry that God is far away from us, that God doesn't listen to us. We don't have to worry about that. He will for sure will respond to us because He first seek us. And then James 4, 8. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. So the Bible says that when we draw close to God, He will always draw close to us. He's always, he always come close to us. He always bless us. He always responds to us, so our prayer is not in vain. That when we pray, it will always bear fruit. So John, uh, first point, John 6, 44, tells us that God tries to attract us to Him, just now in the last passage. So when we respond and come close to God, He will come close to us. So when we pray, for sure He is here. So we should never say, God, where are you? We should always say, no. Uh, we should always say, Lord, I know that you are always here. And even when we don't pray, He's still here. And when we pray, He, 
His presence will become stronger. And second point, where God is, He will bring blessings and raise us to a high level because that's the nature of God. The nature of God, He is a God of blessings. He always brings blessings and He raises us to a high level because He treasures us and wants to do good things to us. And third point, when we think of praying, we should think of building up a loving relationship with God. And this will help us to enter God's plan. So when we think of prayer, we think of building up a one loving relationship that we enjoy God more and more. Hallelujah, we can enjoy Him. Okay, so this passage, I'm going to give more passages about motivation for us to pray and to obey God. I hope in this process you learn to see the wonderful nature of God. That we want you want that we see that God is so loving so we have confidence in Him and we tell people how loving God is then people will be attracted to Him and then we will also experience His help we will experience His help I experience His help all the time I experience Him telling me how to teach better I experience Him uh, giving me provision so I can bless more people and opening, opening doors for me okay now another Bible passage to motivate people to pray, John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will, shall be done for you. So here it says that when we live in Him and then He will live in, in us, and then whatever we ask and desire, it will be done for me. And no, I'm sorry, it says my word. So earlier it says that when we abide in Him, He will abide in us. And then here it says that when you abide in me and also my word abides in you. So that means that when we believe in God's word and obey God's word, then whatever we ask and desire, what you desire, it will be done for you. So when we love God more, have a good relationship with God, we know that our prayers will be answered. So the Bible does say that the prayer of the righteous man is powerful and efficient, that it will produce effect. The first point, God cares about whether we stay in Him. So in, uh, God cares very much whether we have a good relationship with Him. Now for me, all day long, I keep loving God all the time. Hallelujah, you're wonderful. Hallelujah, I love you. I, I, I know that you're loving me. I appreciate you. I enjoy your love. You're so wonderful. Hallelujah. That always stay in God's presence. And number two, when we have a close relationship with God and let His Word stay in us and guide us, God will answer our prayers. So the Bible tells us when we live in Jesus and the Word stay in us, then He will answer our prayers that, you know, that there are some Christians, they are lazy, they always seek after money or chase after girls, they just want what they want. And sometimes they say, God doesn't answer my prayer. Some people answer me, oh, God doesn't give me more money. God doesn't give me a wife. Now we have to examine our life. So do we have a close relationship with God first? And then the third point, when a person follows God's word, his prayers are not just about his needs, but about the relationship with God and his kingdom. So when we, you know, when we follow God's word, because this passage said earlier that my word abides in you. When, a, when God's word abides in us, then the prayer is not just about our needs, that we don't, we're not just praying for things but about the relationship with God and His kingdom. So we want to pray for a close relationship with God. I love God. I want to follow God. I, I desire God. I want to obey God. I want to glorify God, the relationship with God and His kingdom. I want more people saved. That way, when we, are, when we have the Word of God abiding in us, we follow God's Word, then what we pray, God will answer and, and bless us. Hallelujah. Another passage to motivate us to pray. Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord and He shall give you the desire of your heart. Now in this picture here, you see this girl in Jesus' hands. She was smiling at Jesus. She was happy about Jesus. Now I hope we are all happy about Jesus. I'm very happy about Jesus. I'm very happy about God. Everything He does is wonderful. I like His love for us. I like His salva uh, salvation for me that I can enter His presence. I like the wonderful body He created for us. I like the food. I like the nature. 
I like the work of the Holy Spirit in me to move me to follow Him. Every work of God I like. I love everything He does. I like very much. Now, I hope you like God's work. You know, there are many times I was in danger and then God saved me from the dangers and I thank God for all those things. God is always good. So I delight myself in God. That means God makes me happy. My joy is in the Lord. My joy is not in the world. Although I enjoy things in the world because it was created by God, but the source is from God. When I look at the things in the world, I think of all of them coming from God. When I eat, I think of the food was prepared by God, was made by God. So I enjoy the food. And so uh, delight ourselves and then He will give us the desires of our heart. So first praying includes appreciating God, appreciate everything God has done, God is nat His nature, His salvation and His work, and delighting in God, very happy in God because of His goodness, because He's so wonderful, I'm happy of God, I'm happy about God and appreciate Him. And then second point, when we delight ourselves in God, He will give us what our heart desires. So many people say, I want something good to come to my life. When we re delight ourselves in God, that God will give us the things we desire, of course, such a pe person will not be just desiring worldly things. He will desire godly things. And, but God will also bless us with the worldly uh, blessings, like uh, the money we need, the house we need, uh, the family we need. Now, family doesn't always need in uh, marriage. You know, for many Christians, they could be single and they have a family of God. So God will give us what we need so that we can follow God's will. And then number three, we should count every blessing to build up our delight in God. So every blessing, I remember how God saves my life, that three times I almost had a deadly accident, and you know, I, I count all the blessings of God. And one time I was, uh, I missed an airplane when I went to Africa for a mission. And I missed a plane and I asked a person, uh, at the counter, they said, I can do nothing. You have to rebook your ticket. And then it was very, very difficult. And then uh, they said, I have to call Hong Kong because I bought the ticket in Hong Kong. I call Hong Kong and then the person says, it's very difficult. So I pray and say, Lord, you can do everything. Lord, you can do everything. Please help me. And then I went to the counter and I, you know, I said to the person, please make a phone call. Please find out what you can do, anything else you can do. And then, and then uh, sh she decided, agree with me to make a phone call. And then when she made the phone call, she looked very surprised. And then she said, the plane came back. I was so happy. The plane came back because I was not on the plane and God opened a way for me. So God's blessing is great that I remember all the blessings of God. I hope you all too remember the blessings of God and say, God is so wonderful. I delight in God. Okay. And then another passage that about delighting in the Lord. Isaiah 58, 14. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So here it says that delight yourself in the Lord and I'll cause you to ride on the heights of the earth. You go higher and higher. You go higher and higher because you delight in me. I will make you become a great person. You will achieve great things for me. So the first point, when we delight ourselves in God, He will cause us to ride on the heights of the earth. That means He lifts our lives to a high level that our life will become very fruitful and meaningful. Our life will not be in vain. Our life will not be a waste but our life will bless many people. And praising God and rejoicing Him are the best thing we can do because that is delighting in God. So when we praise God and say, you're so wonderful, we rejoice in God, then we are delighting ourselves in God and then God will cause us to go higher. So these two passages talk about when we delight ourselves in God, that He will answer our prayers in our heart and then He will also cause us to go higher and higher. Now, here I talk about different kinds of prayer. Wait on the Lord. Uh, now, this kind of prayer is to uh, be more quiet. 
It could, could be listening to Christian music or it could be in quietness. We just think about God. God, you're so wonderful. The prayer will be slower. And let the Holy Spirit flow in our heart. Thank you, Lord. You're so wonderful. Just let the Holy Spirit guide our prayer. Not to think of what we want. Just let the Holy Spirit guide our prayer. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And then sometimes when our mind is more relaxed, we can hear God's voice. And the Bible actually says that we can hear God's voice. In John 10, 27, my sheep hears my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now hear my voice, it doesn't necessarily mean an audible voice. It could be a thought, an idea. Now I know for sure that I heard God's voice. Uh, now here it shows, uh, actually every Christian can hear God's voice. It, very often it's thoughts that came to us from God. So all Christians can hear God's voice. He moves us to repent. That is God's voice. When we sin, God will speak to us in our heart to cause us to repent. And to sometimes He moves in our heart to motivate us to follow the Word of God and guide us to make decisions. Guide us to make certain decisions and later we find out that it's from God. And He stops us from making mistakes. And He tells us the needs of other, some other people so that we can help them or pray for them. So this is, these are ways that we can hear God's voice, that every Christian for sure will hear the voice of repentance, the voice to remind us to repent. And number two, the more we pray to Him the way, and wait on Him. Now wait on Him is not wait for Him. Wait for Him is like waiting when, when, when will God speak to us. Wait on Him is like the waiter waiting on you, serving you. So we serve God. We stand by God. Oh Lord Jesus, we worship you. We love you. We adore you. We need you. Just relax in God. Stay in God's presence. The more we can hear God's voice and His voice will guide us to His wonderful plan. And uh, I hope we all learn this way of praying. That we quiet ourselves and relax and we could be hearing, uh, listening to Christian music and and or meditating on the Word of God and relax and and let the Holy Spirit guide us. Sometimes ideas just pop up in our mind that didn't come from us. Now sometimes God's voice comes to us when we first wake up or when we are about to fall asleep or when we're doing something totally not ready for the voice of God. Suddenly an idea comes to us. So I hope we pay attention to ideas that came to our mind that doesn't come from us, that it just pop up. And so that motivates us to wait on the Lord and we can hear God's voice more and guide us more. For instance, I notice when I'm preaching, I'm not really thinking of the next point. Now, when I first uh, preached in the past, I was thinking of what is the next point, what is the next point. But now I just let the Holy Spirit flow in me and guide me to speak the Word of God to speak the heart of God. Now here is warning. Now for everything God tells us to do, always there is a motivation of grace. But also there is a warning from the law. If we don't follow, what will happen? So the warning to people who don't pray, James 4.2, You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. So here, many Christians don't get what they have because they lust for it and they don't have it. And they murder and covet. They want to get something for other people and they cannot obtain. You fight and war yet you do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. With wrong motives, I just want more money. I want to, I want uh, an enjoyable life only. I just care about myself. I want the best to myself. So all these are asking with the wrong motives. Then it won't come. God doesn't like that. So that's a warning to people. First point: God wants us. God wants to bless all real Christians. He really wants to bless us. 
Many Christians have many problems in their lives because they don't pray or because they pray with wrong motives. Why do people have so many problems in the family or financial needs and uh, in the ministry? Even there are some ministers who have problem with the ministry because they don't have a close relationship with God. Because everything we do comes from God and the results come from God. So when we serve God, it's the most important thing to have a close relationship with God. If we serve God and don't have a close relationship with God and don't pray and don't read the Bible, then it's a waste of time. It's just serving with human ways. Okay? Now, uh, at this point, I think I will pause and let you have a, a short rest before I continue. So here, uh, just now we finish motivating people to love God, to, uh, to love God and to pray to God.